Okay. Are we ready to go? I'm not involved in this episode. Okay. Well, that's staying in. (laughs) (laughs) I guess it's time for a non-cold open and to say thank you all for joining me. We have a special episode in which we are talking passwordless. So to kick things off, we don't have a Watchtower Weekly, but we do have 100th episode giveaway. So to celebrate 100 episodes of Random... We've done 100 episodes. This is ridiculous. To celebrate 100 episodes of Random but Memorable, next episode, we are giving listeners the chance to win one year free of one password. Is that all? Can we do something better than that? Anna, I know you're here. You're just listening in. (laughs) You want me to actually be on this episode, even though I said I'm not going to be on it? I mean, sure, be on the intro. Okay. Can we do something better than one year? We've done 100 episodes. We can give 100 years of one password for free. I mean, I mean, that might be a bit much. We might have overdone it there. Okay, five years. There you go. Five whole years. Okay. We're going to give five years of one password free and some one password swag. Yeah, we've just decided that on the spot. <laughs> Edit the show notes quick. Yeah. Uh, all you need to do is leave a random but memorable or a funny review of the show. So it's, it's got to be it's got to be a good review. Uh, I mean, it has to be a memorable review. It could be, I hope it's three stars or higher, basically. But it it, it could be potentially lower than that, as long <laughs> as it is funny. I don't know. The one star reviews are always hilarious. <laughs> don't you just love the one star reviews? I don't, I don't want to encourage that though, Anna. Yeah. But okay, so send us your reviews. You don't have to review us on an app store. You can do it via Twitter. Uh, you can email them into us. Rue also takes personal critique very well so uh, you know any of that via email or via the the normal podcast and app stores uh, we will see them all if you add it to the app store and we read it out please just make sure to email us at the same time so we can get your contact details use the ask one password hashtag on twitter or email us at podcast at one password that's the number one password dot com so Welcome to the Passwordless Special. This is where we discuss some of the most recent developments and challenges to passwordless technologies. On the show today, we have myself, Matt Davey. I'll be chatting to Matt O'Leary, OnePassword's VP of Technology and Partnerships, and Ernest Chi, OnePassword's Senior Director of Business Development. So let's talk, first of all, about kind of at a high level, what exactly is passwordless? Uh, and can we do a, a key explainer for, for some of the terms? That sounds great. Thanks for having us on. So I think passwordless is a, it's an umbrella term that describes any sign-on method that doesn't require a username and password as your credentials. And so when we think about authentication, there's usually three factors that we talk about. There's something you know, something you are, and something you have. And with passwords, traditional password credentials, it's really based on something you know. And with passwords, it's a combination usually of something you have and something you are that allows you to authenticate. And a lot of these passwordless factors are already used today as secondary authentication factors. So things like temporary codes on text or email, email magic links, social sign-on or enterprise SSO are all examples of passwordless authentication that's already out there and, and pretty widely adopted today. But perhaps the, the most promising and relevant one of late has been has been WebAuthn. So there's a bunch of these out there today. The key fact that I'd kind of like to dive in for a second is every one of these is backed at the moment by a password, right? Like you have a, a device passcode and you have device biometrics and one is a fallback for the other, including like, you know, social sign-ons and temporary codes via email and all of this stuff is mostly used as like second factor, right? And the, the social sign-on, you still have an email password. So the rise in, in passwordless technologies, for me, the interesting thing is that a lot of these new ones like WebAuthn, for example, they are literally replacing the password. There is still something that you, you, know, you have and you need to store and keys on devices and, and things that you need to manage. And the, the user experience of which is kind of dodgy in some places right. and the ownership of such is dodgy in certain places. But I think that's the most interesting about WebAuthn. Do you want to kind of dive in and tell me a bit about, you know, WebAuthn and where it comes from? Yeah, I think that's the beauty with WebAuthn is that it's something that is truly passwordless in the sense that it isn't relying on a traditional username and password as as a backup. And so WebAuthn is this 
It's an open standard that has been developed by the FIDO Alliance and the World Wide Web Consortium. And it, it enables authentication using a public and private key pair instead of usernames and passwords. And it works nicely because with the private key pair, that private key is always stored in a user's device and is never kind of shared or sent out anywhere in order to authenticate. So unlike a traditional password where you're typing that in anytime you log in on any device, um, that key pair does stay private and it stays with you. And that's part of the magic of not needing to rely on some sort of backup factor. And I think the interesting thing from a, you know, looking at this from being in security is just the how future looking this is. I have one login that is classed as WebAuthn, and that's for Fido itself. So I don't think these things are, are very widely adopted at all yet. So why don't you give us an introduction into, into what Fido is and what, what they're doing? Yeah, so Fido is this, it's an open industry association, and they develop and promote passwordless authentication standards. And you know, I think they play a really important role as this open industry group. And not only are they developing new passwordless technologies and standards, but they have a really important role to play to ensure that you know these standards they develop play nicely across all devices, operating systems, and platforms. And so that interoperability is part of the magic that's going to lead to true adoption of passwordless. And they have a pretty large membership base. A lot of the industry-leading technology companies, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon are, are all members of Fido, as well as 1Password, which we recently joined the Fido Alliance a little over a month ago. Yeah, I saw that. That was great. What is the the significance of this? Maybe Matt O'Leary, I know you were involved in, in making that partnership a thing. What's the significance of, of Fido, do you think? I think just to build on what Erna was, was saying about you know how long Fido has been around, it is, a, I think, a 14 or 15-year-old organization that for that period of time has been calling for the end of passwords. And I think that if you look back on just some, you know, there's a Fast Company article headline from a couple of months ago that was being widely shared here at 1Password, talking about the death of passwords. There's the exact same headline that you can find in a 2013 article. And going back to 2004, Bill Gates was claiming that, you know, passwords were going to be eradicated. I think that just frames how difficult of a problem this is to solve. And when you say that this is a future-facing thing with WebAuthn, I do think there's a lot of positive components to making kind of headway to solving this issue. And I think the reason that we wanted to join the alliance, that 1Password wanted to join the alliance, is that we feel we have a very, I think, interesting role to play in helping to manage that transition. You know, when you look at WebAuthn, when you look at passkeys, that is just another way for users to authenticate. And I think another way of looking at that is that from an end user standpoint, it could just be very confusing. And I think 1Password being at the table in those conversations and helping to manage this move towards a world without passwords, that's why we were excited about joining. Yeah, I, I actually tweeted that finding how you signed in is the new finding your sign in details. And I, although it was a, a witty quip, I think it's actually pretty true. I have massive issues today when there are a million passwordless options and I can't remember which one I, I took. I, I know recently we also announced the beta of a social login for 1Password. So you store it in 1Password and you go onto that website and it literally tells you, hey, you signed in with Google or you signed in with Facebook. I hope the sign in with Facebook one, it kind of gives you a little reminder of the bad decision that you made there and helps you correct it. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> So going back in kind of history to WebAuthn, could you in simple terms kind of describe how it works? Yeah, hey, I'll, I'll do my best. It's certainly a bit of a, of a complicated topic behind the scenes, but we talked a bit about this use of a public and a private key pair to authenticate with WebAuthn. And, you know, initially that was designed to be used with a hardware key. And the reason is that, you know, a specific public and private key pair gets generated for every service you're signing into and every device that you're using. And so there's no recycled credentials. There's no sharing of credentials. And that really heightens the security of this WebAuthn solution. But you know, it makes it quite difficult for the everyday consumer to adopt. And so with your public and private key pair, the actual kind of the middle part of here is that there's an authenticator required and it creates a signature using the private key that you have um, that can be validated against the public key to say, okay, well, Matt, you are who you say you are. We've verified your identity and here you can have access to this service. And these authenticators, they come in the form of supported browsers, you know, 
Chrome itself and, and many browsers have support for WebAuthn already built in now. Uh, it can be hardware like a YubiKey or you know the device biometrics on your on your laptop or on your iPhone. I was chatting to a friend a couple of days ago and he has a YubiKey and he put it on his car keys because he was like, well, if I lose my car keys, like I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty screwed anyway, right? Like I, I, I want it there as like a, a failure point. And then he needed to get access to something and his wife had borrowed the car. So he had to wait for her to get back before he could access his authenticator key. I was like, you need, you need to probably buy a few more of those. I, I think I have like four dotted around the house, uh, just tucked in various places. And I think the thing with authenticators too, Matt, to that point, you have worked in security for 10 years. So of course you have four dotted around the house. But I think for the everyday consumer, the expectation that they would take those kinds of you know actions, which is a lot of friction for anybody to even figure out how one of those things works. I feel like that's an important piece of why maybe adoption hasn't been as great as, as FIDA would have hoped. Oh yeah, 100%. Uh, like even I get myself twisted in in turns and yes like i'm a designer i'm not the most technical technical of people but like i feel like i should be able to use these things and they're incredibly difficult yeah some of them you know you put in and it mounts like a usb drive but it also does something else the quality of experience even with the like the base of standards is really difficult to maintain but going back to kind of web or then it's been around for like a long while right what do we think is the kind of level of adoption? Yeah, it's been around for a number of years now. And the, the adoption has been quite low for a lot of the reasons that we just talked about. And not to pat ourselves on the back here, but going back to one of the reasons that I think we're all excited about joining FIDO is that the focus today has been really on creating these standards and the technology, whether it's a public and private key pairs or otherwise that enables authentication to happen without credentials. But the next step now, the next phase towards getting real adoption is thinking through the design and how to make it user friendly for not just these, you know, small set of really critical use cases where a hardware key might make sense, but how do we make it practical for everyday services like signing into your email or to, you know, speaking of meta, your, your social media accounts. And so as we kind of try to shift away from this initial version of WebAuthn and, you know, replacing hardware keys with software keys, that's going to hopefully unlock a, a lot more adoption, especially amongst the you know less technically or security minded folks. And so that's some of the progress of, of late that is starting to come out in the news and with announcements from FIDO itself, as well as the, the major platforms that there are soon going to be multi-device key pairs that FIDO enables to work with WebAuthn and, and software authenticators are going to be able to work on all, all sorts of different devices. And so that's pretty exciting for us to see. And it's a, it's a great time for us to be kind of leaning into this as part of our products as well. I think that just to add to that too, Matt, you know, one of the reasons that FIDO was interested in having us join is one password's success in getting a mass amount of users to adopt a security solution. And I think that that design and UX component, those things that really make us distinct and that you know have allowed us to have millions of people using our products, I feel like that's something that we'll be able to bring to our involvement with Fido. And by we, Matt, I mean specifically you. <laughs> and that's pretty exciting. That's good. I like it. You're putting it on me now. <laughs> so let, let's dive into to pass keys. What exactly is that? And how is it related to, to WebAuthn? Yeah, so pass keys is this you know brilliant consumer-friendly branding term, but I think passkeys is just the newest implementation of WebAuthn where it's no longer based on needing a hardware key or a dongle that you bring with you everywhere, but that these you know, private keys and credentials can be stored in, and synced on your devices themselves. So it's a big step forward that's going to help make adoption you know, more realistic and more possible. And with passkeys, you know, you're still using the underlying WebAuthn standard and technology to sign in to a service but you're not needing to set up every single device separately for every service. So one of the challenges with how WebAuthn was initially designed is that you've got to take that hardware key with you to every device you're signing on. And with software keys, you'd have to set up a separate private key for your computer, for your phone. If you're at a friend's house and you need to borrow their computer to sign on to something, that's another kind of onboarding step, which makes it really quite cumbersome. And passkeys is meant to kind of remove that by allowing a single key pair to be synchronized and stored securely across different devices. You know, back in May on World Password Day, Apple, Google, and Microsoft made a bit of a splashy announcement that they'd all start to build native support for passkeys on their devices and that they would make it work nicely across their respective platforms. And we saw that just earlier last month, Apple previewed a little bit about how passkeys will work during WWDC as well, which was 
which is exciting. So that does sound promising. What are our general impressions and does this actually mean the end of passwords? I don't think that it does, at least not for some time. And I think that's an important piece of, of our view here, which is that it's great to see these large platforms cooperating and trying to create just a better user experience across the internet. But I think that it is still very early in terms of how they are figuring out how they will support it within their own ecosystems and really how well it will actually work across platforms. You know, I think the reality is that Google, Microsoft, and Apple have great reach and are you know cooperating on this initiative, but they all also are big businesses with lots of shareholders who want them to continue to build lock-in and people using their products. And so I feel like solving that problem of how pass keys will work across platform will take some time. And it's actually where the opportunity lays for 1Password, which is that you know we can work seamlessly across any platform that you're on. That's the value of our product. And I think taking that value and applying it in a passkey world is another huge opportunity that we have. There's no silver bullet out there that is going to spell the end or transition from passwords into a passwordless role. There's going to be a, a long transition period. Just think of how many passwords and credentials we all individually have set up across different devices and over years or decades of using the internet, right? So there's no magic flip that can be switched to make that leap over to passwordless, but we're certainly you know, excited by some of these developments here. And Haskey seems to be one of the mo- most promising ones of late. To essentially take your, your metaphor and, and completely, you know, blow it up and, and abuse it. Like <laughs> there, there will be multiple silver bullets for passwordless passwords in general, I guess, and bullets of all different kinds. And I think where the opportunity for one password lies is an abstraction layer above that. For you. So you don't care about what particular bullet that you are killing passwords with. It is just kind of the layer of abstraction that you care about. I think that kind of thing is really important from the customer experience point of view that you don't really need to care that much about how and where passwords are going to be killed. You just want a better experience. And I think we're not quite at that point at the moment where Apple are certainly hyping up pass keys, but really like it should get to the point where I kind of, I don't care. It's just a thing that seamlessly gets me in. And I think the hype kind of equals the amount of effort that they require at the moment. Because like all of these other services, you still have to like think, okay, do I have to create one on this device? Do I have to like, have I created one in this browser? Do I have to like, you know, work this out? There is still some thought there. So I, I think we are really in the the early days. I, I think too, to add to that, Matt, the other thing is that most people do not care how they authenticate. And I think the other thing is that if you look at all the different ways that you can authenticate, the one that is the most trusted currently, for better or worse, is passwords and username. And I think that breaking that habit of this very well understood way to authenticate is going to take a lot of time. Uh, and I feel like that's where also we can help to manage that transition is educating people or just making it easier for them not to even know or care how they authenticate by just doing it for them. So let's talk about what the role of a password manager is in terms of passwordless adoption and as that grows. How do we feel in one password about passwordless auth? Like, are we excited? Is this a is this a threat? Yeah, we're certainly excited about passwordless. We see a lot of the benefits and security improvements of passwordless factors like WebAuthn and anything that has you know the potential to help our customers be safer and more responsible in how they navigate the internet and digital lives. Like, we're all for it, and we would love to see more consumers adopt that. But we view it kind of like you've mentioned earlier, Matt, as one of many new you know ways to authenticate that will gain popularity and gain adoption. And our job here is to manage them all seamlessly so that as a consumer, you know, it doesn't really matter to you how you're logging in or authenticating to a certain site. For using 1Password, hopefully we have that sorted and a little bit more seamless for you. So how is 1Password planning to support passwordless authentication? We have plans to build support for, for passkeys and WebAuthn. And part of what we've seen with this latest beta for managing your your social sign-on credentials and 1Password, that's going to extend to other ways of authentication and pass keys and WebAuthn are probably next up in terms of what we look to add towards. So wanting to make it easy and safe for you to save the pass keys that get generated for different services right into 1Password, making them available and you know synchronized everywhere, whether it's your phone or your computer or any device you're logging into 1Password in, that's kind of the magic sauce that's made it successful to date. And so we certainly want to bring that experience to passkeys and WebAuthn as well. Uh, it's stupid question time, right? 
I know we're all ridiculously biased on this call. You know, speaking for myself, if the whole password problem is solved and all of passwordless is is just smooth as all heck, like I'm perfectly okay to retire and find another job or open a coffee shop or, or something like <laughs> that. But why is one password as a password manager well positioned to store and I guess manage your passwordless credentials? Like why are we good for this? So I think we're biased, Matt, but we were all users of the product before we joined one password. Uh, maybe not you you've been here a long time, but I was one one password two for me. Oh wow. I'm a veteran. I, I think the reason that any user uses one password is this is solely why we exist. To help you secure your identity and privacy online and manage your credentials. And the platforms certainly want to do this. They want to make it more convenient for you to use your credentials and do that securely. But that is not their core business. That is not why they exist. You know, they exist to sell devices or personalized ads. And I think for me personally, as a user, having an entity like 1Password or any password manager that exists solely to help me do that, that I think is a big opportunity. I also think that authentication is going to get more complicated before it gets simpler. You know, there's going to be a transition period where consumers that were already there, in fact, are using a combination of passwords, social sign-on, passwordless credentials for various services. It's what we talked about earlier, being that abstraction layer and making people not have to think about how they're signing on and just doing it for them. That, I think, is going to be an opportunity for us and other password managers that's only going to grow. Very nice answer. Matt O'Leary, everyone. (laughs) So, So let's talk about some of the risks of essentially like one password as a third party not managing this like what are the risks to platform and ecosystem or browser like any of these things locking you in i think that risk is too strong of a term all this will end up doing is that whatever ecosystem you're in it will make that experience work better but i think the reality is that i know i am personally and most people are are working across multiple ecosystems and so just having a friction-filled experience, if you are in that, in that scenario, that I think would be the user problem. I, I certainly wouldn't call it a risk. And I do feel like, as we mentioned earlier, us and other password managers are in a great a place to help to bridge that gap, to make it more seamless to work between different platforms. I had to download another browser just this morning. So there we go, just to, just to try out a new service. Yeah, I think it's, it's still pretty early for, for pass keys. And I know that... You know, the platforms themselves are, are still working hard at figuring out how they're going to support this, how they're going to make it interoperable. But from what's been previewed so far, I think it leaves a lot of questions. And I think the focus to date has been how do we support passkeys really nicely within our own ecosystems first? And then the next step is how do we make interoperability a real thing and a really seamless experience? And there's probably been not enough time for us to really solve all those problems yet. And so I think Matt's right that risk is too strong of a term, but for this to really be successful and get you know, adoption the way that past versions of passwords have maybe failed to live up to, it will have to be a really better experience than passwords everywhere you go. And that doesn't really happen unless cross-platform support is a reality and third-party apps like 1Password can help manage that along the way. So I, I guess the, the big next question is, what comes next? What do we expect to happen over the next few months following these announcements from Fido, Apple, and, and, and at WWDC? Like, what is next? I think there's going to be a, a strong marketing push that continues to get you know the everyday consumer more familiar with this concept of why passkeys are, are great and, and better than passwords. I think we should expect to see Google and Microsoft's own kind of previews of how passkeys will work in their ecosystems. And in the fall, I think we'll start to see this really get in the hands of consumers. And I think we're excited to see what that feedback and reaction is. And when we see it you know, being used on a day-to-day basis by the general public, I think we'll learn a ton about where it can be improved and continue to iterate there. It's going to be interesting from like my view to see the internal twists from probably Google and Apple mainly, but they both have sign in with services, right? They both have sign in with Google and sign in with Apple. It will be interesting to see where passwordless sits alongside those services. All of that unfolding, I think, will be will be fascinating. We will uh, no doubt comment on this show more as it unfolds. How should users really prepare themselves for passwordless auth and, and pass keys and this type of stuff? I think you know the answer to that question, Matt, which is to download 1Password if you haven't already. <laughs> but you know, I, I think 
really, maybe listeners on this podcast, but not everybody, you know, this is really exciting, figuring out how to manage your identity and your life online. And I think just being informed about what's coming and how it's going to work and how it will impact your life. That would be the other thing that I would say. It's just to learn more and stay on top of the news. Yeah, absolutely. There are so many kind of exciting things unfolding now that I really have to like not get excited about for a, quite some time. I think it's going to take like a little time for these things to unfold and, and get good and, and that type of thing. And I think like you mentioned identity a, a couple of times on the show. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that really excites me is the did which is the decentralized identification that the W3C and Tim Berners-Lee himself signed the other day. As of this show all gone through and, and everything like that, it will be years before we see stuff like that. But my goodness, if you want a incredibly technical, slightly dull, sorry, Tim, you know, look at what the future of identity and authentication like might look like, that is a great document. So fast forward 10 years to things like that. What do we hope authentication will will look like in this in this world i think our hope is that authentication becomes as secure as it is easy you know i think when we've heard our ceo shiner mention a few times in various media requests that our job is to to make the secure thing the easy thing and, and that's what's really going to get traction and adoption and i think in 10 years you know hopefully that reality where we've talked about it doesn't really matter how you're authenticating passwords or not. We've made it more secure and we've lessened the burden on consumers to try to manage all these credentials and how they're signing up to various services. So hopefully we've reached a point where we can really simplify what's required of consumers to sign in and log in, but at the same time, made it much more secure. That's awesome. And and speaking of China, join us on our 100th show next episode to find out questions that have nothing to do with his work uh, or his job and things like how he spent his last vacation and who would play him in a movie and all of those types of questions. I, I hope you're as excited about that as I am. So finally, on the on the passwordless point, like where can folks learn more about one passwords, future plans for passwordless authentication and all of this kind of stuff? I think folks should continue to tune into this this lovely podcast. Keep an eye on our blog for new announcements. I think we're making a, a really concerted effort to share things as we go, as we learn more about passiveness and try out building new support and new features. We want to bring our customers along for the ride. So stay on top of our blog and, and this podcast and make sure you're on the latest version of 1Password to try out all the features that are in beta. That's awesome. All right. I want to thank you both so much for your time. It has been a fascinating conversation and a, and a deep dive for once uh, where we take up the entire show. It's a random but memorable first, but maybe not a last. Like, again, please tweet us with the hashtag AskOnePassword. Instead of asking a question, give some feedback, post a review and win something. Thank you both again for joining. And all that's left to say is love you both. Goodbye. Thanks, Matt and Anna. Yeah, thank you for having us on. Goodbye. Goodbye.